This is Tommy's Outdoors 103, tommysoutdoors.com. Tommy's Outdoors is a podcast where we explore human-wildlife interactions and our relationship with nature. Ladies and gentlemen, today our guest is Professor Graham Warren of the University College Dublin School of Archaeology, and we're going to discuss hunter-gatherers. Who are hunter-gatherers? What is the definition of hunter-gatherer? And that might not be what you think it is. And also, how hunter-gatherers impacted their environment and how they interacted with wildlife around them. Obviously, as usual on those podcasts, we're going to go on a lot of tangent. And one is especially interesting to me, which is if the wild boar was really native to Ireland and what hunter-gatherers had to do with it. Uh, Folks, Professor Graham Warren is a specialist in archaeology of hunter-gatherers, lead of UCD hunter-gatherers research group, and a vice president of the International Society of Hunter-Gatherers Research. And before I let you enjoy this episode of the podcast, the biggest thing you can do to support the podcast is to share this podcast with your friends and colleagues, with anyone who is interested either in, in this episode or in general in topics we discuss in here. Like and comment, share it with your friends, leave the review, and if you want to go an extra mile, now you can buy me a coffee. Buymeacoffee.com slash Tommy's Outdoors, link is in the description down below, get in there and help me stay caffeinated so I can bring you more of those episodes. And now, ladies and gentlemen, without any further ado, Hunter Gatherers with Graham Warren. Graham, welcome to Tommy's Outdoors. Thank you very much for the invitation. Delighted to be here. Very good to have you. Uh, it, it, and we, we're going to talk about subject that I really wanted to talk for quite a while, and I want to understand. And just by, by our brief conversations earlier on, clearly hunter gatherers is is probably this is much more complex topic that that I thought and most of our listeners uh, thought. So I'm I'm really I'm I'm really curious and, and uh, excited for this episode. But before we start, I just want to ask, like, how, how, it start, how it started for you? How you ended up working on the subject of hunter-gatherers? Was that something that you always want to do? You know, you were playing in the woods as a kid, you know, pretending, or, or is it just your career, you know, took a sudden turn and now there you are? It, it's, it's maybe a bit of both in, in some ways. I was... Um, my path into into archaeology. So, so I'm I'm an archaeologist who happens to work on on hunting and gathering groups in the in the deep time past. And it wasn't always obvious that my path would lead me to archaeology, and perhaps not particularly obvious that it would be hunter gatherer archaeology. And in, in particular, I think that like many people as a as a teenager, didn't didn't quite know exactly where I was going to be going to be going. And in the end, um, at, at postgraduate level, I found the I found the subject that I loved. But my my parents um, recently had found in the in clearing out their their attic, they had found some drawings from when I was perhaps seven or eight years old at school, um, which were a, an exercise all about hunter gatherers. Um, and actually, it, it immediately sparked in me a very strong memory of what must have been a kid's encyclopedia of some kind. I can picture the book it had a white. It was A4 size, the big pictures of um, hunter-gatherers and mammoths. I can picture it so vividly and distinctly. So, so something must have stayed with me um, from that. And it, you know, it, was, it was very lovely to see those pictures. But this wasn't, this wasn't always the route I was, I was going to take. It, it, it suits me well now, but not, not always obvious. Right. And, and now you're like a full, full-time lecturer and, and researcher uh, and a university, you're, you're just teaching courses on that as well, outside of uh, and doing like a research work as well. Yeah, so I'm a, I'm a professor of archaeology in the UCD School of Archaeology, so it's University College Dublin, where we we research, we teach, and we we do administration. Um, <laughs> the favorite of, part, I guess. <laughs> all of the things that come as as part of a of an academic life, and we I I teach some stuff which is about hunter gatherers, 
So I, um, we, we're now teaching a new uh, one-year master's program on hunter-gatherer archaeology. I, I also teach stuff which, which isn't hunter-gatherers. Mm-hmm. And I do um, research on hunting and gathering communities in, in deep time. Um, particularly at the moment, I've had a few projects ongoing in Ireland, but some projects in the, in the mountains of Scotland as well. Most of, my, most of my own work has been in Ireland and been in Britain, but the study of hunter-gatherers is a, is a global phenomena. So you, so you learn and you find out about, about lots of other places. But as I said, my, my interest has always been in trying to uncover a little bit more of the complexity of, of ways of living that are, that are in the landscapes of Ireland and Britain. Gotcha, gotcha, and I, and I guess there are also like a conferences where where all the people can do, who, who, you know, like a fellow scientist can gather and 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 talk about it. Yeah, absolutely. The um, a variety of different conferences, and we're we're delighted that next year UCD is hosting the the biggest um, conference of hunter gatherer researchers and specialists. It's something wow. called the the conference on hunting and gathering societies, um, and should have about five hundred um, delegates there now. Covid and the Delta variant, you never, you never quite mm-hmm. happen. But the the plan at the moment is that um, that will be held in Dublin in late June 2022, and we we hope to be launching the website and all of that kind of stuff very shortly. So if people are interested, just keep an eye out for for Chags. Right, right, very, very good. And they can also follow you on Twitter. What's your Twitter handle again? It, my um, Twitter handle. There's a there's a couple of them. So there's the me personally, which is at Graham M Warren. And then there's the 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 hunter gatherer research group at UCD, which is at Hunter UCD. Oh so, wow, wow! What, what, one's a, a mixture of my own interest and work, and the other one is supposed to just be work. But they they kind of <laughs> yeah. I, I, I guess we all we all we all do that. Um, listen, so let's let's jump right in and let let's start with the very basics. Who are or or what are hunter gatherers? Like what is the what is the definition? What and and by that you know I I kind of asking this question as broadly as possible because I guess we have a modern hunter gatherers who are living you know alongside us in the same time and we have hunter gatherers like you like you mentioned in the in the deep deep past right did I pick that the, the deep yeah. past so what is the definition and and how does this you know who who they are. Um, that one question could probably keep us going for two or three hours. Wow. Uh, it's, it's a very, it's, it's a very interesting, and it's a question with multiple levels that you can you can try and unpack. And how people have have defined that idea of hunter gatherers has changed over has changed over time. And it, I think it's it's really important to to take your listeners back to to some of the recent ways that that idea has been constructed. So we're here to talk about hunter-gatherers because we think that there's something interesting about people who hunt and gather. We think there's a thing called hunter-gatherers, people who live in a, in a particular kind of way. We've been, we've been trained to do that through school, through history books, through media. We're trained to think there's a, a thing called hunter-gatherers. Now, th- that, that idea, a lot of work of recent work has kind of traced the origins of that idea back to the 17th and 18th century, at a time of European colonialist expansion, and a time when Europeans were encountering very different ways of life, radically different possibilities of organizing human societies. And at the, and at the same time, they were developing schemes that made sense of that diversity, that made sense of how human societies might have developed or changed over time. And many of those schemes, though they might not have used exactly the term hunter-gatherer, they were focused in on how people obtained a living. So they talk about the, the hunters and the herders and the farmers. Now, those schemes often had a, a very strongly evolutionary narrative to them. So the people started as hunters and then they may have become herders and then they became farmers and they progressed and they progressed and they became more complex until you end up with the most complex and perfect of all, which in, obviously in those commentators' minds was, was white European men. <laughs> and, and, and those schemes took very different forms, but they also served as justifications. So some of the schemes, for example, looked at the evolution of property rights. So they started with this kind of semi-imagined hunter-gatherer who doesn't have any property, who doesn't own land, who doesn't have many possessions, 
And they ended up with a sequence of changes that gets you through to Europeans who increasingly were buying, owning, establishing exclusive rights to things. So the, the hunter-gatherer in part was a kind of imagined other to the Europeans of the 18th and 19th century. And, and, the, and for sure, inferior, and, and by extension, uh, we need to conquer them and civilize them and do all these things, right? Exactly. Absolutely, exactly. And that's, what's, and that's a really important part of this, because what happened was, that let's, let's take an example where we imagine um, settler colonialists meeting Australian or Tasmanian Aboriginal communities. Mm -hmm. They were considered not just to be geographically distant, but they were considered to be distant in time as well. They were considered effectively to be the remnants of the, of the Paleolithic or of the Stone Age. I heard somewhere that you, like indigenous people or, or in, in, in Australia, they were classified as wildlife at some point in, in, in Australian law. Uh, the, I, I don't know the detail of that one, but certainly lots of those conceptions were very, very similar to that. Hunting numbers were constructed as being radically inferior to, to colonial settlers. And that enabled, let's be frank about this, that enabled the displacement of those people and it enabled the genocide of those people as well. And from, those, from those origins, the term hunter-gatherer then shifts and moves again as you come into the 20th century and it becomes the subject of, of further anthropological study. And, and anthropology itself is a discipline that's born out of colonialism. It has its own its own baggage, lots of skeletons in the in the closet there. But this idea that there might be some kind of distinctive way of life that is associated with hunting and gathering has kind of coalesced again in the in the mid twentieth century, and has diversified since then. But you've had some people who focus in on on subsistence. That's what's interesting about hunting and gathering is that they hunt and gather wild food. Others look at the social organization. Now it, because to be honest, the fact that they eat wild food is not particularly exciting. What's mm -hmm. interesting is what that might mean in terms of how they organize their society. Are there distinctive patterns of gender relationships or power relationships, whatever, whatever those might be? And again, it's moved on since then, and people have looked at ways that hunter-gatherers might understand the world, understand their place in the world, and might understand their, their neighbors, the, the people that they share. They share the world with. And what has become increasingly clear is, although, again, particularly in the Western media, there's often quite a strong stereotypical image of, of hunter-gatherers. In actuality, hunter-gatherers, defined as those who consume wild food, that's the, their subsistence basis, they are enormously socially diverse, enormously culturally diverse. So, yes, some of them are that image of people with few possessions, moving around a lot, living in small groups in different ways. Others live in permanent villages of hundreds of people. They have hereditary leaders. They have hereditary slaves. They have enormous accumulations of wealth. So there's enormous diversity within that phrase. Most of the time, I think, in the popular Western media, there's a particular group of people we imagine when we're talking about hunter gatherers. Yeah, that's, yeah. A, that's a start at answering that. That, that yeah, that's a that's a very good. It could run a, a bit longer. That's a very that's a very good start. And so, when I, so for sure, there. But there is an element of evolution of people. Like so, what? Like if we if we take a concept of a deep time, the the very first people who could be described as hunter-gatherers, where, when, where it was. was. Was there like a first modern humans? And then we say, oh, these are, they are hunter-gatherers, right? They're not, um, you know, Neanderthals or whatever. I, I don't know now if I'm going too far. Or like, and then from that point, there's like enormous time span where there are just modern humans. They're just people. And we all, it, 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 so this is a question, are we all kind of putting them into this one basket or they all hunter-gatherers up to the point where farming started to be more prevalent or, you know, I don't know how it's defined, like more than 50% of the food comes from farming. Like uh, when it starts and, and when we say like, well, they are, these are not hunter-gatherers anymore. Well, and again, it's, uh, 
It's it's a good question because it's it looks like it's a simple question that should be an easy thing to answer, but it actually opens up lots of these questions about the concepts again. So, at, at a at a, a basic level, for hundreds of thousands of years, humans of very different types of humans subsisted on wild food. That was the, the their main food stuff. Now we can talk in a little bit about the. It's, it's easy to get into this distinction that there's wild food and there's domesticated food. Now that that's a, a horrible simplification, and mm-hmm. I want to come back and, and unpick that a bit. But it, it's a truism that for many hundreds of thousands of years, human species of different types relied on wild food rather than farmed food. So to that extent, they, they, they were hunter gatherers. If your definition of hunter gatherers is they rely on wild food, what that what how those groups were organised socially is a different question entirely. So were they organized in the kinds of ways that hunter-gatherers we see today in the in the anthropological, the ethnographic record? Were they organized like that? That's a subject of considerable debate. And that one becomes even more interesting when you try and take those things across species boundaries. So to mention Neanderthals, Neanderthals and humans are, are subtly different in terms of their demography. And we, we, we know and understand that now. And then Rebecca Ragsyke's books, Kindred, recent book there is fantastic on this. Those changes in demography would have had really important consequences for the organization of society. It's to do with you know, the gestation period, so the developmental period of, of children and all those sorts of things. So whether they are hunter-gatherers in the way that we understand today is, again, a, a difficult question because they probably didn't behave in the same way as any hunter-gatherers we know today. They are still part of that bigger group of hunter-gatherers, but you have to unpick and start taking that question apart. In terms of when people stopped being hunter-gatherers, or the, the first thing is that many people continue being hunter-gatherers right into the into the present day, and often in often in incredibly difficult situations and and subject to persecution from nation states of, of different kinds. But the the, the overarching um, story on this is that within approximately the last 10,000 years, in a variety of places around the globe, we've seen the rise of domesticated plants and animals and the transformation of subsistence routines into those based around farming. And, and you're quite right to say, is it 50%? Is it whatever? Lots of different definitions of that, mm-hmm. that again. But that's within the last 10,000 years that that shift has, has taken place. And from those centers of domestication, farming has then spread across very large parts of the world. And more or less, it's the case, not entirely, but more or less, it's the case that hunter-gatherers today are surviving in landscapes which are fairly marginal for, for agriculture. Mm-hmm. Yes. And so how, how important is it to understand and, and well... These are these are kind of like a ethical problems also when you talk about modern day hunter gatherers, right? Because you know the question I want to ask is like how important is it to understand our past as a hunter gatherers and those past people? How important is it to research and and see how modern day hunter gatherers live, right? But then there is, I got this feeling, this, this ethical problem, right? That you go in like, now I'm going to research you, primitive hunter-gatherers, to understand, like, it's like, uh, right? So can you elaborate on that? Yeah, exactly. If you've picked up on that really well and articulated that really well. There is a, there's always been this tension from the, from the mid-20th century on when, when anthropology begins to, to focus in on hunter-gatherers. Uh, again, and there was a, a key conference in Chicago in 1966 called "Man the Hunter." But don't worry, they did "Women the Gatherer" a few years, a few years afterwards. <laughs> that very much was part of this idea of we we must be studying hunter gatherers today because they are a, a represent they they represent the last remaining examples of what was once our, our common way of life. And then there's been lots and lots of reaction and discussion. About it's about this this key question about whether hunter gatherers as they live today are in some ways reflecting this ancestral condition of humanity um, and very strong arguments about that in different directions and and one thing which is which is very clear is that all hunter gatherers today are impacted on by the modern world in different ways be that through the use of modern technologies so they may still be hunting but they might be using a rifle. 
doesn't really stop them being hunter gatherer it just makes it a bit easier for yeah. them to do things albeit through displacement through land pressure or key problems at the moment with um conservation agencies and there's lots of conflict between conservation agencies and and hunter gatherers as well but they are all hunter gatherers are part of the modern world so they're in they are in no way a a, a, a kind of fossilized pleistocene deep time form of humanity I, I I heard about I heard about a uh, group who lives. Was it in Guyana? I don't I don't remember. But like, the one thing is that they have their they they're hunter gatherer. They have their structure. They have their shamans, and they have all these things. But uh, one of the guys has a Gmail, and you can email him, and and he will take you for it. You know, for a fishing trip up the river, and so on. So this is the, this impact of the modern world. It's like, well, hunter gatherers, right? Yeah, but it doesn't stop them to have a Gmail. <laughs> Not at all. Not nor should it. And again, it's the you know, it, depending on what what you think the core of a of a hunter gatherer might be, if it's about how they understand the world, their their mode of engagement with it, the their their perception of the world and their relationship with the world, then of course you can do that with Gmail. <laughs> absolutely, yeah. absolutely the case. Um, no. So yeah, it's it, it, these sorts of things become really interesting to try and to try and think through. So yeah, so the introduction of rifles, for example, in a number of cases, there's some good North American examples that that changed levels of risk in hunting. So actually, had quite complicated implications for the age at which men could get married because they were able to go hunting earlier and go hunting alone earlier, establish records. This is going back into 19th century, and as various different rifles developed in a really interesting way those technological changes had impacts on social structure as you have these really complex relationships which have always been there between people their subsistence practices and the the technologies and the materials with which they surround themselves but yeah any any assumption that a hunter gatherer group today is in some ways representative directly representative of hunter gatherers in the past is is clearly problematic and and quite offensive what what may be more interesting then is you try and think well there's all this diversity and we can't just say the past is so the, the present is the same as the past so you might start to try and think well are there particular are there particular structures or particular commonalities in a hunter gatherer way of life that might that might allow us to think that this was the same in the past as in the present. So one that people have been starting to look at is there's a there's a, a so-called magic number in, in hunter-gatherer studies, the, the band, a group of people, uh, uh, perhaps two or three related families, although we, we're not just limited to biological kinship here, and we might talk about kinship later, but two or three families, fairly fluid, people move in and they move out. But often, if you look cross-culturally at hunter-gatherers, particularly the more mobile types of hunter-gatherers, not the, not the very settled ones, the more mobile types of hunter-gatherers, those groups tend to be about 25 people in size. And it may be that some of the key features of, of hunter-gatherer sociality, the emphasis on sharing, the, the lack in many cases of very elaborate architecture, um, that maybe some of these things are actually related to those particular demands of spending most of your time in a group of about 25 people. And, and they've done ecological modelling and 25 people is actually quite a good balance between not having too many people that you're going to eat all the food in the area, but having enough people that you've got enough of a chance of getting hold of all of the decent food. So maybe that's, a, that's an avenue there where you can see some ground for commonality that there's a, there's a kind of reason or a logic to having that number of people. And then once you have that number of people, that creates certain demands on, on living together. And some types of social structures might arise in, in response to that. So that, that's, a more, that's a more interesting way of trying to deal with that question than simply this group here are the equivalent of 117,000 years ago in, in that place over there. Yeah. Like how how um, difficult and controversial is the the whole area because i can i can imagine now you can tell me whether i'm right or wrong but i can almost imagine that there are some people who would say like oh we need to preserve this unique ancient way of life therefore they're not allow rifles right and is so which obviously 
it, it doesn't make sense because they are just people and why they want why they wouldn't use rifles right and then there's like well maybe if they're not using rifles still should we introduce that you know it will help them but then we will impact their way of life and so how how difficult is is that a, like a big talking point or is that like a big issue along these lines you know how we impact and should we shouldn't Yeah, I mean, you, this this is somewhere where I, I defer to to my anthropological colleagues, really, and particularly those in terms of in terms of development anthropology. But there are you know, hunter gatherers are always this imagined space, and they've suffered significantly from the from the wishes of others being imposed on them. And sometimes those things that that we see, you know, that we see now as very problematic, were were in some ways well intentioned at the time. We you know, we must civilize these these people or whatever whatever it might be we will introduce these different ideas the i think the those pressures have always been there in in different ways and and this isn't work i've i've done myself at all but my my instinct on that would be if if there's something that these communities want to do that allows them to maintain their community then they should be allowed to do that be that rifles be that whatever it might male accounts be that whatever it might be it, it really must be stressed that hunting and gathering communities today are under enormous threat of transformation um, and it is possible that we will live in a world where there are virtually no hunter gatherers left very very soon so if things that those communities want that they feel they can they can sustain their way of life then that has to be the overriding the overriding determinant yeah and do you <laughs> obviously this is so wide and there's so many different that there's there's impossible to 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 make a general statement but in 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 general do you are these communities would like to preserve they their traditional way of life and they just under pressure of you know development and like i, I heard about horrific things that are happening in brazil for example uh, for to to these indigenous people and or are they seeing the way of adapting as a as a way of survival do you is is there so, so again I, I, i suppose a couple of points one once more i'm i'm an archaeologist yeah sure sure <laughs> I, i deal with most of the time a, a long dead Um, and it, my my anthropological colleagues would be would be better placed to to answer mm -hmm. that. But we we must be really careful here, not just to assume that all hunter gatherers are the same. My, imagine that in most hunter gatherer communities, there are some who are who are desperate to maintain traditions, and others who are perhaps much more willing to to change. In ways, a, a diverse bunch of people, just like yeah. just we are. Okay, okay. Let's 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 shift gears then and come back to the to the deep past. Um, and you mentioned that group of 25 people, which um, made sense to maintain balance in the natural environment and the balance of, you know, uh, animals in the, in, the, in the area. So can you comment on how, in the, in the, again, I'm referring to, to the past uh, time, how is that balance achieved between extraction of the resources and trying to preserve you know uh, because i i think that a lot of people have this um you know absolutely idealistic view of of you know hunter gatherers of all people that, who were lived always in a perfect harmony with nature and everything was rosy how does it how does it look like yeah so that's and and that comes again to There's a few strands here. I'll, I'll, I'll try and I'll try and pick them apart in in the appropriate order. The so there's always been this idea that hunter gatherers are somehow part of part of nature. Um, they they tread lightly on the on the world. They don't take more than they more than they require. And and at times that argument has been has been used by hunting and gathering communities themselves um, for for political gain. And there's this kind of the, the myth of the of the ecological Indian or the or the green Indian. And those those are particular North American phrases. And again, the, the phrase Indian is, is is problematic. But those were phrases that were picked up in the in the late 1970s and late like late 1970s and early 1980s. And um, and this idea that hunter gatherers are a, a part of nature is again part of this developmental series. Humanity has stepped away from nature 
We, we now transform nature. We've created history. We create change, apart from those poor hunter-gatherers who don't, because they're still, still part of part of nature um, over there. And, and they're, you know, in some ways, then they're, they're prehistoric. And there's a, a double meaning of prehistory here. One is that they are in prehistory in the sense that we often think of it, a time before history, but also that hunter-gatherers are somehow incapable of making history. They are prehistory because they cannot generate change at all. So they're static, they're timeless, they're just part of part of nature. The, the other part of this which comes up is the we we increasingly increasingly recognize all around the world that hunter-gatherer communities had significant impacts on the environments in which they lived. They um, they changed those environments, they influenced the ways in which plants and animals grew and behaved and moved. And in many cases, they made those environments significantly richer than they would have been had there been no humans present. So again, there's a scale here. There's a, you know, they didn't all do it to the same extent. They didn't all do it in the same ways. But the idea that hunter-gatherers simply lived in a natural landscape is a, is a myth and a really dangerous one again. And this comes back to the, and I, I'll, I'll say something about some of these modes of, of transformation of the landscape in a minute. But again, in terms of colonial expansion, European settler colonists arrived in many countries and assumed that because the land wasn't farmed, it wasn't cultivated, it was theirs to be taken. And there's a body of legal writing from the 17th century on that basically says, if you're not cultivating the land, if you're not improving the land, then you're not doing anything of value. So we have a right to take that away from you. But when those European settlers arrived, they had an incredibly narrow ethnocentric view of what agriculture was of what improvement was. So they simply failed to recognize lots of very long lived, subtle tra traditions of landscape management that had massively changed these places. And they said, no, you're not cultivating, you're not farming with Western approaches, therefore this land is ours. So it's fascinating because it almost sounds to me like discussions that we have these days in the, in the modern time, like in the, about the cap and about, uh, farming and about uh putting people putting subsidies to you know improving land and leaving it to nature and like no no you need to farm and you need to be grazable conditions and it's like it's 21st century it's exactly the same conversations we're still having it's fascinating it, it and the the, yeah, the the imposition of that particular european version of farming has been ecologically devastating in many places Australia and america would be would be good examples of that and yeah to Just to, to think about the North American case, for example, lots of colonists there considered America to be, to be God-given to them. And it was God-given to them because it was so rich and so productive. But actually much of that richness and productivity was the result of thousands of years of indigenous land management, which they didn't recognize at all. They, they saw the consequence of all of those sorts of things. So, so those processes of transformation of landscape for hunter-gatherers, that, that's something which It's becoming more recognized now across a variety of, of work in archaeology and paleoenvironmental sciences in, in different ways. And, and really good work um, now looking at um, hunting and gathering communities and how they are structuring and influencing their, their landscape. And hopefully that's going to be an important shift in people's thinking about these landscapes. It's still, it's still far too common to see the assumption that there was a natural landscape with hunter gatherers as part of that natural landscape until the farmers turned up and then we changed and began to transform. And, and just to, to think about some of those processes of transformation, they might include um, deliberately taking, taking wild plants, taking wild plants and perhaps moving them so that the nice ones you want are all in one area together. Or maybe it involves taking away the weeds so the plants you want can grow better. Maybe it involves replanting the biggest of the tubers that you've drug, um, you, you dug up. It might involve moving animals to islands, to in, bringing them into new environments. It might involve constructing very large stone um, game drives in different ways, or ways to stop the movement of fish, along with a whole variety of ways of changing the environment, of influencing that environment. And most of the time, that seems to lead to a greater ecological richness, and probably for the communities, a reduced risk as well because obviously a, a diverse environment is one where if one of your resources goes you've probably got a few more backups in there 
it's a hugely important area of research. And, and, in, and in deep time, you've seen that my comments about prehistory and the problems with that term, you're now saying why I was saying deep time on that. In, in deep time, trying to understand the details of those processes of landscape management and modification are, are quite challenging, but we're, we're getting better at it. So what would you consider deep time? <laughs> now you're putting me on the spot for all of that. It's a deep time in some ways in, in the way I'm using it is referring to the, the timescales of archaeological analysis. We're dealing with periods of time which often, not always, are covering hundreds or thousands of years. So you're, you're talking about often reasonably low resolution moments of, of archaeological data. But really, it's, deep time is just putting us back to, for, for the work that I do, working mainly on Irish and British material, most of what I work on is somewhere between about 15,000 years ago and about 6,000 years ago. But I, mm -hmm. th there are colleagues who would work on hunter-gatherer material that's much older than that, and colleagues who work on hunter-gatherer material that's much younger than that. As well. Yeah, you, you're, you're, Graham. You're, you're busting a lot of, a lot of misconceptions and, and my own, my own misconceptions as well. And like one of, one of these is that you mentioned that they quite often planted, moved plants, and 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 built structures to herd animals. Like that sounds awfully like farming. Like uh, you know, me being completely, you know, uh, lame and. I was like, oh, these, these were not hunter gatherers. They were farming. They moved the plants here and they build it. So, but they are still considered hunter gatherers. Yeah, and this this comes back to it's it's part of these problems about our definitions and splitting things up into into. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, I, I mentioned earlier that just saying there's wild food and domesticated food is is problematic. Domesticated food is food that's undergone a particular series of changes wherein it's reliant on humans for its for its reproduction. But clearly you can be cultivating, you can be manipulating, you can be tending these plants. And perhaps with some plants, if you do that for a thousand to two thousand years, perhaps those plants might undergo some of the genetic changes that mean that they become domesticated. But that's not that's not always the case. And the, the, the you know you, you're you're right about that idea that many of the practices we're talking about we often associate with farming, not hunting. Gathering. But that, that's due to the poverty of our of our imagination, um, knowledge of this. There's a, a very important and interesting debate. Uh, Aboriginal Australian called Bruce Pascoe a couple of years back wrote a book called Dark Emu, which um, tried to argue that at contact, at European contact, Australia was characterised by a, an agricultural system of some kind uh, as farming. And he gathered together loads and loads of evidence of where hunter-gatherers in Australia were modifying their environments in different ways. It's caused a huge debate. Um, and there's a, a, a recent book just, I've only read the summary of it, I'm waiting for it to be shipped from, from Australia, a recent um, response to, to Pascoe's book, which is trying to summarise all of that evidence again. And, and it, as I understand it, basically saying that in most of what he said about the types of practices that hunter-gatherers in Australia were doing in promoting the growth of different things. He was correct. There's some nuance, there's a few things there's disagreement on, but that there's, they're still not farmers. They're just hunter-gatherers. And this is all part of that broad suite of practices that hunter-gatherers across the world, in many, many different environments, practice in different ways. And I think we, we have to get out of the mindset that says it's only farmers that do these sorts of things. And, and recognize that's a, uh, it's, it's a simplification but it's also a simplification which has actually caused enormous violence and enormous suffering in different ways. And therefore, we should, we should educate ourselves about it. Yeah, yeah. No, and, you know, even if, if you think about it, we tend to like to have this line in the sand, like, right, hunter-gatherers now, and, you know, some dude wakes up in the morning and goes out like, hey, all right, folks, we are farmers now, right? And this is like a gray area but that's both practices were being in use in the same time and it's like hard to say whether you hunter gatherers whether you probably they were just people who are trying to live their lives pretty much like we do right and now we come in it's like no well, now we need to put them in a box and this is the box you're in you're the, the um the, the the idea of hunter gatherers is such a powerful part of the modern imagination that uh, hunter-gatherers are, 
are held up as as what we what we were in the deep past, but they're also held up as the kind of opposite to what we are today. So I have a, a paper coming out shortly with some colleagues, Noah Lavi and Alice Rudge, where we we argue that in modern media stories, often today the hunter-gatherer is both the, the kind of antithesis and the antidote to modernity. The problems of modernity can be solved by living like a hunter-gatherer again. And it's this really, really powerful stereotype that, that it captures so many of these ideas. We think that that's, that's our ancestral past. Somehow we took a wrong turn with the Neolithic. We took a wrong turn with farming. We're no longer in some way being true to, to who, we, who we are in some way. And it, it's all kinds of really interesting ideas about how your identity is, is structured, that somehow inside your head, there's a hunter-gatherer struggling to get out. It, it just, it's, it's, a fascinating, it's a fascinating series of discussions to, to look at, but the, the cultural power of that idea of the hunter-gatherer is enormously significant. I'm 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 just so happy that you said that because this is what I see very often in the discussion like you said like as if we along the lines done something wrong and now we need to roll back everything and go back to some you know ideal prehistoric state when everything was fantastic and that also ties to this discussion like what's natural what's unnatural and and again this is discussion I, i'm honestly graham i'm blown away how many of the discussions that we have right now about farming and about going back to nature and quotes and so on how many of those you're actually picking this out and this this going this is going so deep in, into into past so it's 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 fascinating fascinating but, and i think oh, well, i'm glad it, i'm glad it's of interest but i think it's because this concept is so central to who we think we are. Mm. Um, it, 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 it's, a, it's one of those fundamental concepts to the, to the uh, uh, yeah, particularly, sorry, I said European a few too many times, I should probably have been more specific about an Anglo-centrism to that and an English language uh, background to, to those things, just because my experience isn't, isn't, isn't in other languages. But it, it's a hugely important category in, in those senses. And Yeah, and you think you can think of other examples of it. So one of the things you often see is people saying we don't we don't have enough nature in our lives, and therefore we must we must go and live like a hunter gatherer to be to be back with nature. And, and that's true. Spending time in nature is nothing other than good for you. But hunter gatherers did that. Subsistence farmers do that. Pastoralists do that at all. Spending time in nature is not the preserve of hunting and gathering communities. It may be something that modern metropolitan Europeans don't get enough of, but it's not exclusively hunter-gatherer. And that's why it's really interesting that so many of the presentations of it do loop straight back to that, to that point. But it's, this, it's a hugely powerful and influential, influential idea, and it, which, which opens lots and lots of interesting conversation. It has to be the, that has to be the point of, of archaeology, of anthropology, of the study of hunter-gatherers. You know, It has to be about finding out about these different ways of life, finding out as much about them as we can, but using that information to open discussions about who we are today, what we think we're doing, our relationship with, with the other things that surround us, and particularly the, particularly the natural world, particularly at a time of crisis. Yeah. And, and did I pick that correctly, that, you're, that you have a paper coming on this, or is it paper already yeah, out? There, there, there's a paper that should be coming out on, on this probably early, early next year. Um, we'll okay. My, okay. my colleagues Noah Lavi and Alice Rudge. Oh, fantastic, fantastic! This it's, it's very interesting, um, Graham. So now there are two things that I that I want to touch on that I kind of connected in in this conversation, and one of these is something that we we really start start a conversation online, and this is uh, specifically in 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 Ireland and wild boar, and it was like a lot of discussion about wild boar, whether they're native, non-native. And uh, so as much as you can, please just explain, like, clear, clear, clear out the things like, what's the deal with the wild boar? Why it's considered invasive? Is it invasive? Is it non-native? Yeah, and this is, this is a lovely example. And I, I was glad to, to start the, um, I think it was Twitter, Twitter conversation mm -hmm. with you about that. It's a lovely example of complexity. So the, this was in, I think, Kerry, Um, a couple of months ago, there was a, a, a significant media fuss and interest because um, some wild boar, uh, we might come back to that term as well here, 
to more boar that had been introduced by sports hunters had been considered to be an invasive species as 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 they are in law this wasn't a this wasn't a, a kind of local judgment they're considered to be an invasive species by law and therefore they were culled um uh, in response to that and there was um lots of upset about the about the killing of these animals slightly ironic given that they'd only been brought into the island in order to be shot anyway just under slightly different slightly different circumstances and they probably weren't wild boar senses stricto they were probably a crossbreed between domestic pigs and wild boar somewhere somewhere in europe and this introduction of wild boar into into Ireland has been happening in a number of areas. It's happened in the Wicklow Mountains. It's happened in Kerry. It, it's something that's been increasing over the last 15, 20 years. So discussion around this, which then also gets picked up upon by the rewilding movement in Ireland as well, and lots of discussion about whether um, wild boar is strictly a native species or an invasive species. And a number of people um, knew or felt they understood the history of wild boar in Ireland and were saying that it was a native species that had gone extinct and therefore it being reintroduced now wasn't an invasive species. This should have been part of our this should have been part of our fauna. I happen to have been writing several chapters of a of a of, of a book on Hunter Gatherer Island or Mesolithic Island or Middle Stone Age Island. I just finished writing a couple of chapters about that which were about animals, plants and the island identity. And it's pretty clear, not 100% certain, but pretty confident that wild boar was introduced to Ireland by Mesolithic settlers, probably in the period following about 10,000 years ago, give, give or take a little bit. So this comes back to the, we talked earlier about the movement of animals to different islands. The, the introduction of boar to island environments happens in other places in the Mesolithic in Europe. It happens in the Mediterranean and it happens on Baltic islands as well. And although it's it probably red deer are introduced to Shetland Island. So we know that people are, are doing this translocation of animals. So the introduction of boar into Ireland in the, in the Mesolithic was a deliberate human act, which almost certainly had quite important environmental impacts. So whether in terms of the modern appearance of wild boar, again, whether that is a, a, a good thing or a bad thing is, is a different question. I'm not, I'm not, I'm not trying to answer that question at all, but they're not necessarily native species in the way that some people think because they're human introductions, although they've been here for thousands of years and become an embedded part of the, of the environment and the ecological relationships. And, and I think one of the points I was trying to make in the discussion around this is that actually that discussion of native invasive isn't actually the most helpful way of framing these debates around rewilding. People want to make an argument for why wild boar would be a useful addition to Ireland's ecology in terms of increasing its diversity, its resilience, all of those sorts of things. That's a fantastic and interesting discussion to have. But laying back and making claim to whether it's native or invasive is really, really tricky, I think, given these really complicated histories of, of people, landscape, animals. And the, the and the way they're bound together. Yeah, it's it's you know that's another one of is another of these conversations that I have quite often. I think that was uh, the case of um, one of the islands, one of the islands in Hawaii, I think, or somewhere else, where where pigs were considered non-native. And and then some of the indigenous people say like, well, hang on a minute, those pigs were were there before we arrived, so are, are we non-native as well? You know, this 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 kind of this kind of thing. So this this immensely interesting because it's kind of the same question, right? Because those people who brought boar to Ireland are really. Uh, well, maybe it's a question: Are they ancestors? I don't know if you, if you can answer that. Are they ancestors of? modern irish people so that would mean that this boar is as native on island of ireland as irish people are native so a, a, a couple of things perhaps are around ancestors we we think that following the the establishment of mesolithic settlement on ireland at the time they brought boar over we think that there is a continuous record of humans 
in Ireland at that time. So in that sense, people people and Bohr have been here about as long as each other. Now, we, we don't know whether Bohr came over on the first boat. You know, we don't, perhaps they've been here a century or two first. And, and sorry, I should have said one of the, one of the distinctive things about Ireland is because it has been an island for a long time, in a European context, it has a impoverished fauna and flora. More plants and animals got into Britain because Britain was connected to the rest of Europe at the time, but then Britain was separated when the channel was formed. So Britain has a more restricted range of native fauna and flora than the rest of Europe, and we're one step further removed from that. So oh. boar introduced into this quite distinctive environment, and it wasn't just boar, but we might, we might come back to that. The question of the degree to which the hunter-gatherers who lived in Ireland are, we are directly related to them, has been transformed by recent um, genetic research. So looking at ancient DNA, as well as some modern population studies. And it seems that mesolithic communities have contributed res relatively little to modern genetic structures. We carry very little genetic signature of those mesolithic populations. Now, exactly what processes cause that whether that's a, a population replacement, whether that's differential rates of childbirth, different patterns. There's a, there's a variety of different ways in which that genetic shift can take place. But those hunter-gatherers, as I say, play, play relatively little part in our modern genetic inheritance. And, and in terms of that myth busting um, and people's ideas about this, and it, this is important because the deep time passed increasingly in, in Ireland and in Britain is being politicised. And we've got a, a rise in language about um, ancestry, about ancestors, about indigenous people of these islands, whatever on earth that's actually supposed to mean. Um, and at times that, that debate has been, well, it, it, it's explicitly racist at times. Let's not, let's not beat around the bush on this one. But interesting to note that those Mesolithic hunter-gatherers in Ireland, based on most of the genetic evidence we have, uh, a part of a, a broader um, group of um, hunter-gatherers in Western Europe who were probably characterised by very dark skin and very light blue or green eyes and sometimes light hair. A, a series of physical combination of, sorry, a combination of physical traits, which is very, very unusual in, in populations today. So they were, they were in some ways quite different than, than, than we might expect. But on the other hand, the same as us. Homo sapiens, exactly the same as us. Yeah. Wow. Wow. That's, that's <laughs> very, very interesting. A um, couple of questions here, uh, Graham. First off, what are the, what are the methods, like research methods that allows to figure out the color of a skin or color of the eyes, people who, are, who live in Mesolithic times? That's ancient DNA. That's looking at genetic sequences and understanding how those the genetic sequences translate into phenotypical or sorry phenotype variation. So how the 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 the, the information that's there coded away in the genes is manifest in an individual. E exactly how they do that, I'd have to refer you to a geneticist colleague. Right. I don't know the exact detail there. And it's not straightforward, particularly around skin color and other forms of pigmentation. But there are reasonably reliable techniques for doing it but i'm i'm not the person to give you the, mm -hmm. the detail no no i i you know i i understand that you're trying to give the very scientific and precise answers and i'm just there's just lobing general questions like oh hey graham how do they figure out that what color eyes are you got? <laughs> those are perfectly good questions we're covering we're covering an enormous range of of topics and we're jumping around um, a little bit from things so it's uh, no they're, they're perfectly good questions cool uh, listen so another another uh thing that i that i want to quickly touch on and, and maybe that is connecting with with these times when when you research the okay hold that thought i have got another question because because you you mentioned it and i think it is it is important i'm very curious you mentioned that there is a narrative built, you know, being nationalistic or racist or whatever else, all these narratives. And you're an archaeologist. And it's maybe a slightly off-topic question, but I really like 
wanted to ask that question to an archaeologist. Would you feel like archaeology is especially prone to attempts to be hijacked for political gain? Because <laughs> I, I read a couple of years ago, I read like I'm from Poland. Uh, I think that most of the listeners know that. And I read a book about archaeological book about origins of not only Poland, but all, all the countries in the region. And it was, it was presented evidence that a lot of states that were set up were set up by Varegs or like they call them Vikings. Only Vikings were the Varegs that came out on boats. And it's like enormous pushback on this because this doesn't align with political history with national history and all of a sudden you're telling us that someone else comes here and that that book was giving other examples like how incredibly difficult archaeology is on this front because it it kind of almost hits against this stone wall of nationalism politics you know uh states things and like do you, is that correct you have this 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 problem let's say I mean, the, the relationship between, and, and this again is a, is a huge topic, and I, I'll, I'll try and pick my words carefully on it. Um, the relationship between archaeology and nationalism and politics and colonialism for that is, is really very, very complicated. Um, and nationalism and colonialism are, are implicated in archaeology and archaeological practices. And, you know, one of the things that's happened over the last 20, 30 years is people are more than that, but people are increasingly careful about those relationships and about trying to to work their way through them very carefully. So there's you know there's a decolonizing archaeology movement going on going wow. on. But the so nation states nation states to just take one approach to this nation states are formed in lots of different ways, but they're often also what's sometimes called an imagined community. There's something that we imagine that holds this group of people to together it's, it's not just a flag those are symbols for it but there's a there's a shared something and that something can be very very variable but often that something includes a, a story of how we came to be a story of how this distinctive nation came into being so that story is often about the past and archaeology is providing information about that past which either can slot into that narrative or in some ways change it in different ways so the, the classic irish example of this would be through the through particularly the early and mid 20th century, but it continues a very strong emphasis in Irish archaeology on aspects of a kind of Celtic Iron Age, but also the 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 the, the early medieval Christianity, the foundation of the Irish Temple Nascelli, Glendalough, all of these sorts of things, which were which were highlighted as a distinctively Irish contribution to European culture. So it's a celebrating different aspects of this to show, in that case celebrating an Irish identity, and some of that began in the late 19th century, celebrating an Irish identity at a time when Irish identities and English identities were obviously being brought into sharp relief through processes around state formation and, and everything that happens through there. So that relationship between nationalism and archaeology is very, very real, and it means you do need to tread carefully and self-awarely in, in thinking about how we make sense of the, of the deep time past. Yeah. And is this, a, is, is this not a problem? You know, I, 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 obviously I don't want to get you in trouble, but in general, is this, is this the problem? You know, there is a new discovery coming up, right? And someone writes it up, writes the paper, and then the reviewers, you or somebody is reviewing that paper and go like, nah, you, you can't publish that. That would get you in trouble, you know, because that's against the status quo that would derail everything else. And, you know, the, the, the hope would be that in a, in a country such as, as Ireland, there is academic freedom that allows people to, to publish and reviews and all of those sorts of things to get done. I'm, I'm sure there are some countries where even today, it would be difficult to publish something which is against a, a state line. I, I've never experienced that personally. I, I, I've not worked in, in places with those types of, of regimes in place, but I, I, I'm very confident that that would, that would be the place. The, the other thing that happens is, you know, and you, it, it wouldn't be right to do this podcast without 
without talking about aspects of this, there, there are environments created in countries which are open to debate and question and those that begin to close them down. So it's played out more in Britain than in Ireland lately, but some of the reactions to um, archaeology and related subjects trying to establish the relationship between wealthy Victorians and uh, 18th and 19th century communities and slave owners for example. So the National Trust in Britain has actually got into lots of trouble and had significant tellings off from the government because they've been trying to highlight that these lovely stately homes are actually funded by the profits from slaving. And a, a government there that is on the very much on the offensive as part of a culture war of some kind. But it's also playing out in terms of the targeting and closure of archaeology departments. Department of Archaeology at the University of Sheffield, where I graduated from in my MA. That's the point at which I said at the start of this, my path to archaeology wasn't clear. That, that's when it became clear. Um, that department, which is a, a world leading department, um, as of last week, has been recommended for closure. And many archaeology departments in the UK in particular, but also elsewhere, are under, are under threat in different ways. So all of this, this richness, this complexity we've been talking about, this trying to challenge people's ideas, all of that, which is what archaeology can do so well, and, and anthropology as well, but I'm an archaeologist, I talk about archaeology, that, that's actually increasingly under threat because of the nature of public discourse and a and university funding model, which is very much driven about money and about student numbers and prioritising certain subjects over others. Now, that's not a very, not a very optimistic note, but I think it's really important to, to stress. Yes, absolutely, and, and I even I even said that uh, I think that uh, I'm kind of trying to get myself to write a blog about crisis of science because I feel like we have we're living through the crisis of science and some of those issues, like you said, you know, finance and 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 uh, yeah, that's for that's for another day. That's for another day. Let's let's go back. Let's quickly go back to to uh, hunter gatherers. I have a. Two more really questions that I, that I would really like to ask you. Um, one of them is, can you, like, I would like you to ex kind of paint a picture how the field works looks like, you know, how you, how you work on the field, you know, like, are you discovering tools? Are you discovering, you know, like, what are the methods? Like, how that, because that, that, that strikes me like that must be very cool part of your job. <laughs> it, 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 it can be fun. And again, the, so I'll, I'll talk about archaeology, not about anthropology. And it's, this is so multifaceted and, and so rich at the moment. So part of what we do is, is excavation. So, um, you know, I, I will, fingers crossed, touch wood, COVID working out and all those sorts of things. I hope to be back over in the mountains of Scotland this September, trying to excavate a, a new site. So we have, we have work, we have excavation, which is fantastic. But that's only a tiny part of it. So once we excavate material, it has to come back to the lab and be analysed. Um, that might involve um, taking tiny fragments of charcoal and identifying them to species and using um, and then applying a varied forms of analysis to those, perhaps radiocarbon dating, for example. It might involve taking the stone tools that have been excavated and examining those microscopically to see if we can identify what they've been used for. We might be looking at the chemical composition of bone in order to say something about the diet of that individual. And, and not just people, you can be looking at the diet of animals as well to understand how they might have moved or migrated. Um, or looking at the composition of teeth to work out where that individual grew up. So there's a huge array of really, really you know, molecular science in different ways, material science in different ways. And there are some archaeologists who don't do field work and they work away in the lab and they make an enormous contribution through that. And there are some archaeologists who do do field work but don't do anything in the lab. It all just kind of, there's a, an enormous array of different ways of, of doing and engaging in, in hunter-gatherer archaeology. And sometimes I think the, the there's that such a, there's that so powerful image of archaeology of people with trowels and toothbrushes in their hands working away. That is important. That, that is how we generate our data. But if it stopped at that, we'd know very, very little compared to what we do now with, with all of that material. And then, of course, even once you've got your results, 
your analysis of the stone tools, your analysis of the teeth, your radiocarbon dates, whatever else it, it might be, you have to start trying to put that into a comparative framework. So you need to, to think about, well, what does this mean if they were chopping up this animal here, or they were making these arrowheads in this way, or they were making this bone point in this way? How does that tell us about how that society may have been organised? How might that tell us, for example, about something about gender relations or trade and exchange between different groups? So you need to have that knowledge of the materials, but then a broader framework, a broader um, a broader comparative perspective on the archaeology of, of hunter-gatherers. Wow. And I should have said the easiest, the easiest way of answering that question would be to say, come and do the Masters in Hunter-Gatherer Archaeology at UCD. That's exactly what uh, that's a, I'm, I'm sure it's a good idea. I'm sure it's a good idea. So, so when you go into the site, you're, it's, it, 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 are, are you expecting or at least partially expecting to you know, find some information on the subject? Or is it like, okay, we're going to do our field work here. We're going to gather all this material And then this is something that's going to be analyzed for the years to come. So you kind of never making assumptions as to what you're going to discover, just kind of like doing, you know, step one. Uh, how does that work? Or is it like mixture of both? Yeah, there, there's a mixture and it changes. So, for example, the one, the, the one we hope to work on this September, this is our first ever season on that site. So one of our aims of this season will be to try and get a better understanding of what might be there. That may then allow us next year to refine our excavation strategy so that we can better deal with the sorts of materials that are coming up. Because you're always so excavation is destruction. Once you excavate something, it has been destroyed. It has been turned into artifacts, into records, into photographs. But those actual layers, those sediments in the ground, you can never put them back in the way they were. So you know, it, it's a it's a thing you have to do with extreme care. But you may need to be making decisions, for example, about how you're sampling so much of the material which we which we analyze is too small to be seen by the naked eye in the field so you take the sediment back to the lab and you sieve it and you sieve it through sieves of um, different sizes so you can recover tiny child plant seeds and stuff like that for example but you can't sample everything i mean it, sometimes it feels like you are and you're just carrying all of this sediment back from the site to the van every day. but you have to have some information to make an informed decision about what you're then going to do. So it's always a it's always an iterative process. And it's one of the, the great things about archaeological fieldwork, the craft of archaeological fieldwork, is it has that kind of creativity. You can't go in and say, well, I dug the last site in this way, therefore I'm going to dig this site in this way. You're, you're always you're always learning, you're always adjusting. Um, if you work in slightly different environments. Yeah. And the, the, like, I think important question, like you mentioned that once you excavate something, you destroy and so what is like how the law works in, in, in Ireland and maybe you also know in Britain in terms of, you know, if, if someone in the field finds an arrow point or something like that, are they allowed to take it? Are they not supposed to touch it? Are they need to report it? Like, how does that work? So, the, uh, uh, so in Ireland, let's speak about the Irish um, example. In Ireland, it is illegal to conduct any form of archaeological excavation without a license. It's illegal to conduct any form of um, metal detecting as well. If you find an artifact, you have three days to report it to the state. It, all artifacts are property of the state. There's actually a very tight legal control on all those sorts of things. So if you if you do find something, um, depends exactly where you are, but often it can be a good thing to pick it up because it, otherwise it might it might vanish. But if you pick something up then you need to take photos of where it was you need to take notes and you need to make sure to to record it the um some of your listeners may may also read mountain log the magazine of mountaineering ireland and we actually had an article in the last edition of that myself and a colleague from national museum of ireland matthew siever we had an article on what to do if you find stuff in the mountains um, and yeah record the spot as best you can don't go ferreting about in it and make sure to contact the authorities that's the that's the critical thing yeah but they that you won't be allowed to keep it no mm -hmm. that's that's uh that's what i thought it's uh, it's worth much more as part of the archive of human lives on this island stored in the museum where it's available to researchers m worth much more like that than it would be on someone's mantelpiece yeah that's for sure that's for sure um, 
you, you like one other question. Uh, we're gonna be wrapping this up, but I, I don't have to add. You, 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 you're familiar with uh, Gobekli Tepe, this uh, yes. massive excavation in Turkey. What are what are your thoughts? Because that's a, that comes from the times where there's supposed to be only. Well, again, now I learned something from you, right? That's back from the times where it's supposed to be hunter gatherers only. But then you just said that hunter gatherers is like not necessarily people who are just you know very primitive. Yeah. What what are you what are your thoughts on on this? massive find yeah and okay so Gobekli Tepe is a is a phenomenal phenomenal site and you know for, for your listeners who might not know this is it's the economic organization at the time is mainly hunter-gatherers although there might be some perhaps their use of some of the cereals is beginning that slow process of domestication but massive um subterranean structures with limestone pillars covered with remarkable carvings it's a it's a phenomenal site which has been which has been talked about in terms of the of the potentially the origins of organized religion um origins of spirituality lots of different different ideas there and i suppose i'd answer that comment about gebekli tepe by by saying it's not surprising and if you look if you look at hunter gatherers around the world they construct enormous rich monumental landscapes and sites so um in America, for example, you have the, the complex of, of mounds at Poverty Point, which are laid out according to uh, quite tight geometric principles and cosmological principles. In Florida, you have massive landscapes, mounds of shell, again, laid out according to big cosmological principles. It goes to the northwest coast of America, and you have massive timber longhouses being constructed and huge accumulations of wealth being redistributed. These are these are things that hunter gatherers do. Um, it's not monumentality is not the preserve of farmers. These are now these these hunting and gathering groups. These probably aren't the kinds of mobile hunting and gathering groups that many people think about. But they're still hunter gatherers overall. And Quebec Tepe is just part of. It's a particularly lovely example. And I'm not trying to not trying to downplay it. It's part of that broader suite of elaborate hunter-gatherer architecture, rich symbolic life, highly ritualized life, and accumulations of wealth. Uh, wow. Graham, that's that's fantastic. You you certainly opened my eyes to many things, and, and you certainly opened the eyes of many listeners to many things. I, I had some, some more questions for you, but after your explanation, those questions just simply don't make sense anymore. <laughs> so I never asked them. You have a book coming up, right? Yep, hopefully. Um, the uh, and thanks for thanks for asking about it. I have a book called Hunter Gatherer Island, which is due to be published in um, spring or early summer of 2022, and it's a the uh, an attempt to to tell to tell a story of hunter gatherer lives in Ireland, main, mainly focusing in on the Mesolithic right. of Ireland, right. and, and mainly written over the course of, of of a couple of lockdowns in different. <laughs> We're nearly there. A few week, a few weeks to go to get the final draft finished off. But, wow! Um, wow! That, that should be available next summer. Next summer, we might do the podcast again, specifically on this book, and and kind of talk about it on it. Yeah, I'd, I'd be delighted to. Perfect. Uh, Graham, thank you very much for your time. Is there, is there anything else you would, would you like to leave our listeners with? Any words of wisdom? Anything that you wish I asked you, but I didn't? Anything, anything we can learn from hunter-gatherers? Well, I mean, you've asked, you've asked fantastic questions and the, it is that opportunity to, you know, the thinking about hunter-gatherers critically and carefully opens up all of these sorts of things opens up all kinds of different directions and, and aspects and things to think of. It's why they're a fantastically good subject to be, to be considering. I, it was, was given the problems about the, about the history of the term hunter-gatherer. And as I said, there, there is significant debate about whether we should be using it today at all. I did, in, in putting the new course together and the title of my book, I did come up against that question, well, should I be using this, this phrase? And in the end decided that it was okay still to use that because in in Western Europe that phrase has such public power that it's a great way of drawing people into a conversation where you can use that phrase and then start to problematize that. But that that hook itself is is I think a really potentially very very powerful and and 
And all of this has to be about, as I, as I mentioned before, you know, all of this work has to be about thinking about how we change the way in which we live now, about how we use our understanding of different ways of life to inform the decisions that we make now, because we're in a time of crisis. We need to think imaginatively and creatively about what we do. And I don't think hunter-gatherers and mesolithic archaeology are necessarily going to save the world. That would be a rather silly thing to, to say. But I think done critically, done reflectively, they can help us think about the ways in which we live and the, and the histories and the choices we've made that have got us to here. Wow, absolutely. That's a, gr that's a, that's a great, great phrase to finish the podcast. Uh, Graham, absolute knowledge bombs here. Thanks. Thank you very much for doing this. Not at all. Thank you very much, Tommy.